So, Vidya, good morning. Should we start? Are you ready? Madam. Very good morning, madam. Yes, Should madam. Start? Are you ready? Yes, madam. Ready. Okay, good morning, everyone. Once again, we are back on Monday morning. Bright Monday morning. Uh, although it's not having all over the country, it's not, uh, the scene is not bright, but still, we are continuing with our uh, excellent activity, which keeps us going throughout the week. And this week, uh, we, uh, Dr. Vidya, uh, I, I think everyone here know Vidya very well. But uh, in the day, I have come to know Vidya closely. Uh, what I feel that Vidya, uh, you are a bright, very soft-spoken and an excellent human being. Besides what uh, I will tell you about uh, your CV, these are the three words I can tell you about, about you. Uh, the, the newcomers, those who don't know about Dr. Vidya, Vidya Vishwanathan is, not, is a consultant, Department of Palliative Medicine, Homi Baba Cancer Hospital and Research Center, which is advised. She is also honorary tutor, School of Medicine, Cardiff University. She is also mentor of Quality Improvement Initiative, Equip India, and she, which is uh, Dr. Nandani is uh, leading the program in collaboration with the center. She is also a faculty of Cancer Treatment Center training program, CTC program, which is uh, a collaboration in collaboration with APHN and AIMS New Delhi. And she is also faculty of Impact India program. So you can see that uh, she, her CV says that she is faculty of many, many programs. And this shows that she is a good teacher. So uh, let's hear from Vidya what she wants to say about how to develop an integrated palliative care program in any of the institute. So Vidya, over to you. Thank you so much, madam. Thank you so much for that introduction. It's really kind of you. And with all your blessings of all the faculty and everyone, I'd just like to start this uh, session today. And uh, Nisha, may I share my screen, please? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Nisha. You can share now, ma'am. Yes, yes, thank you, Nisha. So I just, uh, thank you, Nisha, and good morning, everyone. And like what, what Madam said, we are living in strange times. But I'm still grateful for this normalcy that Monday morning holds, because uh, I think since the time the IPC sessions started, 6.30 a.m. on Monday morning, we all tune into this session. And it has been a wonderful learning experience. So um, today, I'd just like to start on uh, a few points about the practical aspects of developing an integrated oncology palliative model in a tertiary care center. So uh, I have made this presentation in three parts. So I thought we'll first run through with the evidence. So what is the evidence that we have in literature? And this evidence does not mean why we should integrate palliative care, but how we should integrate palliative care. And then I thought of talking about a little about my experience with Homi Baba Cancer Hospital. And the last part, which is close to each one of us, is the emotion in walking this tightrope between oncology and palliative care. So when we talk of the evidence, we start with the word integration. And so when we start with integration, we first come to a team, because whom do we integrate with? So when we talk about the team, what is the philosophy of this teamwork? And so here we have uh, Freeman et al, who, who have spoken about the, free, uh, about the philosophy of teamwork, where they call it as a directive. That means the director heads and the work is done accordingly. Elective, where everyone performs clear roles and an integrative philosophy, which assumes that every professional's contribution has value. So this is where all team members are team players and communications and discussions are given equal importance. So now coming from the philosophy of integration to the integration in healthcare, we talk about integration at 
if, if we look at it from the oncology perspective, how do we speak about integration? So when an oncologist makes a palliative care referral, it is a linkage that is happening. When there is a referral based on certain trigger criteria, then these are defined processes of integration and that becomes a coordinated effort. When we talk about full integration, it means that the resources are pooled between oncology and palliative care. Now, these are different aspects based on the healthcare system's resources, the patient's population, and what palliative care is already provided by the oncologist. And like Abraham Lincoln once said, that you can link some people to all, you can link all people to some, but you cannot link all people to all. So now keeping this in mind, let us see what integrated palliative care actually means. So there was this working definition, which was by the European framework, which said that integrated palliative care brings together administrative, organizational service aspects, all of this, and it recognizes con continuity of care and aims to achieve quality of life in this, up till the supported dying process for the family and patient. But now I come to David and Huey. I think most of the literature in how to integrate is from David Huey and Bruera, so which from MD Anderson. And so here he defines it beautifully as saying that it goes beyond the mere presence of an outpatient clinic. It is the comprehensiveness of the interdisciplinary team, the level of availability, the degree of collaboration till patient rounds, which are all important. So keeping this definition of David Huey in mind, we now go to the models of palliative care delivery in an integrated model. So what is the evidence we have? So Finlay et al outlines this outpatient PC model. So what do they talk about outpatient PC model? They call it as three different types of models where they say, there is an independent model which runs on its own. It has its own space. It has full control. There is the co-located model, which is what many of us have at centers, wherein we have the palliative care OPD and the oncology clinic in the same setting. And the time is coordinated with oncology. This is how we have it at our center too. So we try and time the visits. So if a patient is coming for chemotherapy and concurrent palliative care, we will time the visits on the same day. So this is what they do in an oncology uh, clinic where you have a co-located clinic. You also have an embedded clinic. So what do we mean by an embedded setup? Wherein the palliative care physician embeds himself or herself into the multidisciplinary oncology setup. These are the three outpatient models and the commonest is the co-located ones that we have at tertiary centers, which is what we have at our center too. And then we have this model, which many of us are familiar with, which is a time-based model. So the old model is now almost redundant, where you say that palliative care has to step in when curative care gets over. The type B is one, the graph that we have seen as we learned, wherein we said the palliative care is introduced from the time of diagnosis, and then gradually the involvement keeps increasing. And the third model is, is one, that we see very often in our setup. So suppose we have an adolescent. I'm sorry, is there, is there a lot of disturbance or am I only hearing it? Can I request you all to uh, mute your mics? Okay, thank you so much. So the, the pattern C is when the level of palliative care involvement fluctuates over time. So what does this mean? And this is a model that we often see at our cancer center at Homi Baba. So what, what, what this means is that we can have adolescents, we can have young adults, we can have patients on the curative pathway like head and neck who come to us with intense distress and a heavy symptom burden. So by the time their symptoms are getting, by the time their diagnosis is actually established and their treatment plan is being planned, we actually step in relieve the physical distress, talk to the family, try and coordinate the investigations and do all of this. Later on, when they start chemotherapy, their dependence on palliative care dips. And in case they relapse, then we are again there for them. So this model is beautiful in a way that the, the, the contact is established right in the beginning. And so when the patient gets referred back to us, it doesn't feel like the, like, abandonment or it doesn't feel like you've been handed over to another team and 
In addition to palliative care, when we provide hospice care, it, it is model D and model E is when bereavement care is, uh, is also added into this. So a combination of C, D and E would actually make a beautiful model for palliative care. That was a time-based model. So again, UEA and, uh, again, we have what we call as the provider-based model, which most of us are familiar with, which says that primary care physicians should provide basic palliative care and secondary physicians, which means the oncologists in an oncology setting provide patient care for patients with complex needs and they see patients as consultants, which is what most of us do. And tertiary setting is where you have an acute palliative care unit. You also have academic centers with research and academics. And then we come to this beautiful model, which is the issue based model. I think this is the model which actually outlines the cancer care package right from the oncology standpoint and involves and explains the benefits of involving palliative care concurrent with oncology care. So here you have three kinds of models. One is the solo model, which is A. This is when the oncologist decides that I can do everything for my patient. I will handle the pain. I will handle the patient till end of life. I will look after the psychosocial distress. I will do everything. The Congress model is when the oncologist says that I am here to treat his cancer. And regarding the pain, regarding the delirium, regarding the spiritual distress, I'm going to send him to a different bunch of people. And these will be different people. The beauty of the integrated model, which is the third type, is that you have two teams. You have the cancer assessment team and you have the palliative and supportive care So this palliative and supportive care team is the one that handles all the symptoms and distress. The oncology team handles the cancer assessment. So, and regarding symptoms and distress, most of the symptoms and distress will be looked after by the palliative care team and they will also try and coordinate. So suppose you have a patient who has come to you with, say, uh, a high jaundice, I mean, with, with, with jaundice and has come to you with a uh, liver cancer. And now um, the, this patient is supposed to have a pancreatic cancer with meds in the liver or with a block for which he needs a stenting. You could be the team who is coordinating the GI consult. You could be the team who is looking after the peripheral aspects and wait till the bilirubin comes down and then a plan is made whether treatment would be possible or no. So managing symptoms distress can be done by the palliative care team and also a bit of the networking between the GI consult or any other consult could be done by this team. So the advantage of an integrated model is that it standardizes patients access to timely and comprehensive and concurrent palliative care. It also, the most important thing is normalizes the introduction of palliative care. Patients don't feel abandoned. They don't feel that they're going to a specialty when nothing else is possible. It minimizes the demand for oncologists to do everything and reduces the need to refer patients to, mind, to multiple, or multiple referrals for the patient. But when we do that, we should also understand that we need a system in place. So you could have an oncologist who practices the integrated model, but in the same sitting in that hospital, you could have two other oncologists who practice the Congress model or the solo model. But how does this benefit the patient? So then again, the background link is that the system or the place where this is located or the hospital has to have an integrated model to standardize the referral pattern, which means that irrespective of which oncologist this patient sees in that hospital, the pathway would be the same. So now we realize that integration is not just between two people. It's not just between two teams. It is the entire system where you have a palliative care team with its own interdisciplinary team, you have the oncology team, you have the systems in place, and you have the entire clinical, administrative, research, and educational facilities which work around this integration. So this is the beauty of David and Huera, uh, I mean, Huey Hue and Brera's model in uh, integration. But having said that, if we always keep the time of prog the prognosis as an indicator or the time of referral as an indicator, we might land up in troubles. And I'm sure most of us working in palliative care see this. I get patients who are referred really early in the trajectory when it is lung cancer. But suppose it's a breast, but suppose it's an ovarian cancer, then that lady will take a long time to reach me. That's because 
from 2010, the evidence is for early breast, early palliative care in lung cancer. But the, so that is, that is what brings us to this model where we talk of complexity based palliative care. So this model is based on the complexity of the symptoms of the distress that the patient has. So if the patient has a standard complexity, it's handled at level one by the oncology team and a palliative care team. But as the complexity increases, irrespective of the prognosis, we might need a more integrated palliative care setup. So that is the beauty of this model, which is based, which is not just an inverse relationship between oncology and palliative care, but it is based on the complexities of patient needs. We see this pretty often in our setup, and that is how patients with curative uh, mode of therapy in head and neck cancer, patients with a large amount of ascites at presentation in ovarian cancer, like we usually do, and we know chemotherapy is going to work beautifully with them, but that first 15 days when they are suffering, when they are in distress, when they, when they are navigating the hospital, when they have symptoms, that is a time when we come in and we have seen this working beautifully for our patients because later on the transitions become really easy. Then we come to one big gray area in palliative care, which is hemato-oncology. Again, integration of palliative care in hemato-oncology in solid tumors is a different thing altogether, whereas in hemato-oncology is a different scenario. In hemato-oncology, again, if we divide it into the different the, the symptoms that we see at our hospital, we usually see patients with multiple myeloma, lymphomas, all of these, and myelodysplastic syndromes. These kind of patients do come to us. They, they, are, they, they are managed for a long period of time. But when we have patients with acute uh, leukemias, when we have the elderly with acute leukemias, and when nothing, no disease-directed therapy is going to be possible, there is a lot of lot of things happening around those patients, especially the family insists on treatment. And so that is one whole spectrum. So patients with hematological malignancies, there are those with a poor prognosis. There are those with an uncertain response to the anti-cancer treatment. There are those with an unpredictable disease trajectory. And there are those with high risk complications. So this is a learning curve for all of us because I, I remember very distinctly that we had this patient with myeloproliferative disease and he once came to us gasping, very, not very good social and financial support as we call it. The oncologist said, ma'am, I've tried the medication. I'm starting on the medication, but the patient is very dysnic. Would you transfer to hospice for supportive care? We said, fine. And we had to shift the patient on oxygen. And his last wish was that he needed an Aadhaar card. So we actually coordinated the Aadhaar card from the hospice, took him in the home care van to the bank, got the Aadhaar card done and felt very great that, you know, this is what we are doing. And we have actually honored his last wish. Now the patient and family, there is a and one year down the line, the patient is still alive. The patient walks into our OPD, he comes and meets us. So that is the beauty of hemato-oncology. And so it is a branch where we as palliative care physicians have a lot, lot of learning to do. And that's something where we work, where we should be, we should, we should be making inroads in. Because the challenges are not just in, the, in, in palliative care alone, but it's in the integration. It is in the trajectory, it is in the variability, it is in the intensity of treatment, it is in setting up therapeutic goals. And then we come to one more gray area, which is pediatric palliative care. Now here again, I think Spandana has gone extensively on pediatric palliative care, told us the needs, told us what they are doing. But to integrate pediatric palliative care, there are still a lot, lot of barriers which we need to build bridges. I wouldn't say break those barriers, but we need to build bridges and slowly move into these barriers in pediatric palliative care. So now once we, this, this, this part was the evidence base for how do we integrate palliative care? You could have a co-located model. You could have a plan with your oncologist saying, let's have a time-based model. Let's have a complexity-based. Let's have a, a provider-based model. So pick the model according to the facility that you have, but in concurrence with the system that you're working in and with the oncologists you're practicing with. 
And then now we move to some of the guidelines. So like we know, ESMO in 2003 had its criteria for designated centers, which I will come to in, in a little in the end. Otherwise, I, thought, I just thought I'll take the timeline from 2012 because most of the evidence in integration started picking up after 2010 and Tamil's paper. And between 2015 and 21 is where we have seen maximum of the papers that have come out in, whatever, in, the, review that, in, in the review that I read for this presentation. So when we come to the NCCN guidelines, very clearly and categorically in 2012, these guidelines outline procedures for palliative care and they were distinctly divided into screening, assessment, palliative care interventions, reassessment and after death care. And then, but this also left a lot of unanswered questions, which said who should receive this palliative care? When should we introduce it? How much should the oncologists provide? What is the setting that is most appropriate for palliative care delivery? So again, we go to Hue and Brera. So Hue and Brera have this beautiful systematic review in 2015 and the oncologist where they, they reviewed all the literature and they identified 38 indicators of integration. I'm sorry for the busy slide, but uh, it's a beautiful article to read. But I just thought I'd put in the highlights. So this talks about 38 indicators. So in what aspects do these indicators fit in? They fit into the, cult, the structure of the program. So do you have an outpatient clinic? Do you have a community-based PC? What is your PC doing? What is your consultation room? How do you have rounds? So that part of it is your clinical program structure. Then coming to processes within your own team, how are you working? interdisciplinary? Do you have an embedded setup? Do you have a nurse practitioner? How many hours are you operating? Are you available for the oncologist? How early is early? What is the sp uh, specified timing? Then coming to education. So are you having cross rotations? Are your oncologists having basic PC continuum competence? Are you training in the undergraduate curriculum in the place that you are in? Then research activity and of course the administration. So under these heads, they divided these 38 indicators. Now, what is, what is the advantage of having this? The advantage of having these integrators is, is, indicators is that it facilitates benchmarking. So you could benchmark for yourself. This is where I was in 2015, and this is where I am two years down the line. So what have I done? And so this is how you bring in quality improvement, and this is how you learn to prioritize your needs. And the, most importantly, how does it help? It helps referring physicians. It gives them a baseline. It gives them a thing to say that, yes, evidence has said that this is the criteria in which I should send my patients to palliative care. It helps caregivers because they get this information and they feel that, you know, taking palliative care is not something like abandonment. It's just going to help my patient even more. It absolutely helps policymakers. It helps administration and it helps researchers. So these are the facilitators. Having they realized that there were two important questions which were still unanswered. And when it came to these questions, it was, when is the optimal time for referral? And who is the ideal subject? So again, it was Huey who did another review and at another review. And this, this came in Lancet Oncology in 2016, where they distilled it further. And they said that we have 11 major criteria and 36 minor criteria. So among the major criteria, one was needs based, which meant severe physical symptoms, severe emotional symptoms, when somebody is in existential crisis, when they are requesting for haste and death, when, they, when you need assistance with decision making, delirium, when there are brain meds or spinal cord compression, you need to step in and bring in palliative care there. Then you have a time-based criteria where there was a lot of debate on the time and they said within three months is a definite when you have your patient with advanced disease. So this is how these 11 major criteria came about. And once they did that, what did they find? They found that clinical base, so all of these, the clinicians become the gatekeepers. So they are the ones who decide when I'm going to send the patient to palliative care. So again, they said that can we better this even more? So that is when we brought in the, it, the automatic referral system was introduced. So this was to overcome the inequity. So then they ran this study 
And then they said that, let us compare the automatic referral and clinician-based referral. But when they did this consensus between oncologists and palliative care, they did a Delphi consensus. And what did they find in 2018? They said that, no, we can't do one without the other. We need to have both. We need to have the clinician referring. We also need to have the automatic referral system so that we could choose whether we want a parallel path or whether we want the automatic referral to augment the clinical referral. So the clinic, so the combination is what the consensus brought about. And then we also have other guidelines which came from ASCO in 2017, which was an update from the 2012 guidelines. Again, I'm not going into the detail reading about this. It again reiterates that those with advanced cancer need help. Those with, they, it defines those with advanced cancer. And we talk about newly can diagnosed patients with advanced cancer too, who have to see a palliative care unit within the first eight weeks and high symptom burden, psychosocial needs should use palliative care resources. So then we come to ESMO. ESMO, we, as we know, is in 2003, ESMO started the 13 integration criteria and they have we have ESMO designated centers all over. So many of us in our country are also familiar with ESMO designated centers. So what did they do here? What they tried to do is knowing that in 2003, these criteria were established, they ran a study in 2018. Again, it was Huey who ran the study in 2018 where he picked only the ESMO designated centers and he actually prepared, there are, there are 13 beautiful quantitative criteria. They don't exactly match the 13 ESMO criteria, but these criteria are quantitatively taken. And what did they try and do? They tried to apply this to the ESMO designated centers and the results is what I'm showing you on the slide. So what does it show? When it shows that inpatient consultation team, 90% of the centers are compliant. Outpatient clinic, 89% interdisciplinary 95%. But where is the lacuna? The lacuna is an early referral. The lacuna is in the patients visiting the emergency services. 80% of the patients visit emergency services just a month before they die. And then the didactic palliative care teaching and the education. So this is how these lacuna, that is as recent as 2018, we are still living with these lacuna. So besides this, there are some other models for palliative care, which were practiced and where there are studies, I've just put them in. So this is at Duke's hospital where they actually found, they did this study where it's a retrospective analysis, where they had two systems. One, the oncology service used to do the rounding all the time, and then they changed the practice. They introduced both the oncology prov provider as well as the palliative care physician. So when they introduced both the palliative care physician and the, uh, and the oncology provider, in between them, they decided who would be the primary physician for that patient. So while taking rounds, they decided that those with a high symptom burden, those who need more palliative care inputs will be by the PC team and, the, and those with more uh, oncology inputs will be by the onco team. And what did they find? They actually found that there was a reduction in the mean hospital length of stay of patients. And most importantly, physicians and nurses universally favored this model. So this kind of co-consulting and integrated inpatient partnerships actually helped communication between disciplines, continuity of services, increase exchange in knowledge and increase in collaborative research. And then this was another one which was done in a Canadian Institute at Tom Baker Cancer Center where they actually brought in a psychologist and they, 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 they actually studied the difference when the psychologist was there and when they were not there and found a remarkable difference. In spite of having all of this, what is the ground reality? This, is, this has just been published. What they say is that, again, it's by Huey. He says that after all this work that has happened, after all the evidence that we have, this is, we're talking of the West. I haven't even come to India. So here, what did they see? They said that 53 NCCN guidelines, the treatment of cancer, palliative care has not been mentioned in over 40% of these guidelines. And it's almost obsolete in hematological malignancies. And another study which was done showed that these integration criteria are too medically focused and is really not improving practice as much as you believe that it would do. So how do we translate these guidelines into practice? So we need operational resources. We need collaboration. We need a structure. We need to define that structure. We need more research to measure patient outcomes. 
and what are the strategies to achieve this? This is our own Dr. Naveen Salin's paper, and this is where the the recent paper where he has where he has told us how we can achieve this integrated model. So going back from all this experience and all this literature from the West, we can actually take it forward from here. Could we practice concurrent palliative care? Could we co-manage patients? Could we try with an embedded model? Could we have palliative care education as part of oncology training? The other way around is usually advised. So why not have palliative care uh, residents rotation, uh, rotating in oncology? Can we participate in MDT? Can we have more rapport building? And could we do the name change from palliative to supportive? This is, this is a debate all over the world. How do we improve the availability, the consistency and continuity of our services and have a clear pathway for our country? So coming to India, what exists? What I could find is that we have the minimum standard tool, which was by Dr. Raj Kopal and updated by Dr. Anjum, which is there with us as a team. I'm talk, uh, it's, it's just that this is the tool that we have as palliative care centers. And right now, like how the NCCN went in and found out that the guidelines were missing, I'm sure most of us remember that when we were at the NCG meeting, when palliative care was introduced into the NCG, we found that we had a whole book. We had a whole set of guidelines on the NCG website. And at the bottom right corner, we would see palliative care somewhere. But we never had guidelines for what palliative care had to do in these situations. So that is when Nandini is now heading this and as NCG draft guidelines for palliative care are being done. So this, I hope, will change the future for palliative care in the country. So having gone through the evidence, I'd like to now touch upon a bit on the experience of working at Homi Baba Cancer Hospital and how we weave in these things together as a unit. So to start with a little bit of the history, uh, Homi Baba Cancer Hospital and Research Center started as an outpatient unit in June 2014, Dr. Badwe there, who inaugurated the actual OPD services in February 2015. And so I'm really, really honored to say that palliative care was one of the first few OPDs to start in February 2015 at this tertiary cancer care center. So we had three OPDs, medical oncology, gynec oncology, and palliative care. So the idea was prevention and palliation at inception. And there we can see, and a lot of people have visited, I mean, a lot of our own faculty, our seniors have visited our, our facility. We work out of containers, which is again unique. I don't, uh, for the last six years, we've been working out of containers and we have grown out of these containers now into the buildings and we are yet to move completely there. So you could see Dr. Gayatri there, Dr. Seema has visited, Dr. Jayata has been with us and Dr. Kalpana and we've had team from TWCC and most importantly, we've had Dr. Raj Kopar also visiting our center. So to start with Andhra Pradesh, in 2012 to 2015, we had this organization, we still have it, is Sneha Sandhya HK Foundation, which is run by Dr. N.S. Raju, who many of you here know, with the twin objectives of geriatric and palliative care. So that is where we're providing home and hospice care even till today. In 2015, we started a dedicated OPD. And uh, opioid availability is through Homi Baba Cancer Hospital since 2015 itself. So these were the two units in the state which were integrating and providing palliative care. So in 2015 to 16, we only had outpatient services. In 2017, we had additional support and that was through Jeevdaya Foundation, which I'm still indebted. They have now, uh, now they have relaxed their support. They've taken away their support. But between 2017 and 21, we have had a medical social worker and a nurse dedicated for palliative care through Jeevdaya. And that has been very, very useful for us. And what we did is we tried to improve the coordination between home and hospice care because integration uh, is about oncology and palliative care. It is also about palliative care and the community. So this integration has to work on all fronts. So that is where we, what we have done is we work as an outpatient unit in Homi Baba. This was in 2017, 18, 19. And from here, the patients who needed home and hospice care, they would be looked after by the foundation through their hospice and home care support. But we, it was never a one-way road. We always completed the feedback circle because we knew what was happening to those patients. That feedback kept coming to us. And for that, again, I'm indebted to the Stanford Quality Improvement Project, which was there in 2017. We took up home care as our project. And through that project, we managed to create a system 
wherein if a patient sees us in OPD and needs home or hospice care, we can shift the patient to the foundation. The patient can still continue follow up and we still are in the loop to know what is happening to the patient and how we could utilize the resources and maximize the care for this patient. Now in 2020, we started inpatient services at Homi Baba Cancer Hospital. In 21, we have an EMR for documentation. We have permanent recruitment for multidisciplinary services. We have a psycho-oncologist, occupational therapist, Within, this, within the hospital, we have an outpatient, inpatient, ICU, and casualty services, and we get referrals from all these places for palliative care in addition to the outpatient services. So the service provision grew like this, and I just wanted to depict this and say that though we are a small unit, we still try and you know spread out our arms everywhere and provide maximum patient care. So this is by, by my travel, and this, this is a, a system wherein any unit can document how you are providing ambul ambulatory palliative care service. So I just put in Homi Baba as one of the examples. So when we say we are running a service, so how do we do it practically? So these are the, on the left-hand side are all the operational issues which one could go into and find out whether this is how you're supposed to run your service. So where is your site of care? Is it a consultative service, which is what we are? What is the duration of your care? We can we keep it at ongoing or long term because we coordinate with the community service. What is our relation to inpatient care? Yes, we do have it. And what system do we work on? We work on a referral process. What is our patient population? In the hospital, it's only cancer. The hospice is not cancer too. And then the cancer patients in the hospice come from different centers too. So what is the care process and the logistics? What is the length of our session? Who constitutes our team? What is the kind of staffing? So for us, we have institutional support for staffing and for finances. And how do we evaluate all this? We use the data, which is in the EMI. So this is how each one of us can actually build up our own operational service and see where we lack and what we are doing. So at Homi Baba, we started, when we, when we go into the numbers of patients, we started with 178 new patients and 339 patients in follow-up in 2015 in the palliative care in 2020, we registered 1,378 patients and followed up 4,978 patients. And in the oncology service, there are 6,800 new patients who registered. So this is, this is just for statistics and for numbers. And since 2020, we've also been seeing IPD referrals, which we see every day, ICU and HDU referrals also. And the most common cancers that we see are the GI, GU, head and neck and lung. Those pictures are just from the upcoming building and the radiation block, which is complete. So the reasons that we see for referrals in our OPD, if you take a snapshot of our OPD, on a daily basis, patients with pain and distress, but these patients with pain and distress come as a spectrum. They could be pending diagnosis, they could be on treatment, they could be in pain crisis, it could be even post-procedural pain where the radiologist calls up and says, ma'am, patient is in severe pain, could you please see him? And very recently, I had a, I had a referral from the security. He said, ma'am, this patient is looking very bad, you see them first, and I actually documented it in the EMR so that the oncologist would not get offended that I saw the patient before that. So patients on curative pathways, like the head and neck cancers, the, uh, the uh, adolescent and young adults who come to us, the early palliative care, like we have enough evidence, those on concurrent palliative care, on chemotherapy, OMCT, immunotherapy, targeted therapy, and those who are referred for best supportive care. So this is the broad spectrum of the reasons of referral from oncology. And why I would like to insist again here is, as much as it is a privilege to do palliative care, it is a responsibility. <laughs> and so many advances that we see, the supportive care umbrella has grown. We have treatable and curable diseases. We have those with curative intent. We have palliative EOLC. We have the entire spectrum. So why is this important? It is important because when I see my patient in the OPD, in an integrated setup, I need to understand the pathology. I cannot just look at them and say, oh, this is head and neck. Because an adenoid cystic Customer head, an adenoid cystic head and neck will, do, will behave very differently from a patient with famous cell carcinoma. Similarly, we need to understand the basics of immunotherapy and targeted therapy so that we know what drugs to give and what not to give. We also need to step in into the pre transplant supportive care arena because very soon that's going to break, in, break out of the horizon. 
we also need to know about our drug interactions with the various medications that are being given in oncology. And another, another area, we see a lot of patients with HIV and cancer, with the first with hepatitis B and cancer, with HCV and cancer, HPV. So slowly, we need to know how to deal with these kind of patients. We also need to know how to deal with dual cancers, because we have a lot of patients with dual cancers. So we need to anticipate symptoms, and we need to do a lot more reading to upskill, because supportive care today has broadened the definition. What we, what we need to remember is palliative care is part of supportive care, but supportive care is much, much more than palliative care. So this is the MACC definition, and this is the team which is actually constitutes palliative supportive care, of which we are one part. So we need to understand that before we use any terminology. So at Tommy Baba, how do we integrate all of this? So how do I know that this patient coming to me is seen by whom? So we have joint clinics and joint tumor boards every day. So every day at one party, we have a meeting where all the new patients the, 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 it, are decided and is documented in the joint clinic. We also have the system of grand rounds where every alternate Saturday, the palliative care consultant, along with the medical, medical oncology consultant, or along with the radiation oncology consultant, does grand rounds. So we have rotations for consultants for grand rounds. Our residents in palliative care rotate with oncology residents, and nurses and medical social workers also rotate through the department. So now there are nurses who are trained in palliative care but posted in the ICU. They're trained in palliative care but posted in DK. So that, that makes it. Uh, that, that percolates palliative care around the system. And family meetings, it's essential that medical oncology or radiation oncology or surgical oncology and us, we all sit together. We have made it a practice that no one will be sent against medical advice or dharma from the hospital. So we document this decision in the tumor board or in the JC that this patient is now being transitioned to hospice care. And then I coordinate with the hospice and our team coordinates with them. And that is how we transition patients. And we register and then send those patients. We have a triage system wherein we transition patients into hospice care. But for all of this, we need a lot of communication coordination, and we have to be there. Crisis management is also important. For example, we have patients who are on curative pathways, completed treatment in head and neck cancer, but suddenly come to us with dyspnea and stride up. Here, this is, this is emergency. We have to realize that, and we have coordinated the trichiosity for these patients. So crisis management, understanding the pathway where the patient is, and then Putting them through that pathway is very, very important, and that is why completing that feedback circle and being constantly in touch is really, really important. So integration through service was through this way. So as service, education, and research are the three tenets of Tata Memorial Center, when we talk about integration through education, the IPCCCPC program since 2017 has been invaluable for us because we have tried to percolate palliative care through to the oncologists and to the nurses. Almost 53 nurses in our hospital and 35 doctors in our hospital have been trained since 2017. And then we have the quality improvement project, which for which we are now a hub, which is again very, very interesting. And we have the ego uh, training, we are a hub there. We also have weekly integrated teaching programs that do mobile mortality meetings and nurses trainings, which are ongoing. When we talk about integrating through research, we have collaborative projects and uh, we have worked, like palliative care has worked with medical oncology, with pediatric oncology, with radiation oncology, with gynec oncology for patients and for work and for research. And we also have a UICC project now at Homi Baba. And the goal uh, Vidya is Madam. Uh, Vidya Madam. prevention. So, uh, excuse me, Vidya Madam, uh, your sound yes. quality, you are breaking up. Your sound quality is breaking up. Is there anything that you can do for that? Oh, 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 oh. I, I really don't know. I will try to come switch off and... your Switch off your video, Vidya. Okay, okay, I'll try switch to off your video and talk. Oh. Not the screen sharing, only your video. Okay, I've switched it off now. Is it any better? Hello? Just continue. I think it's a bit better. Continue. Okay, so integration through research. 
is through collaborative projects. We also work together in communities and we celebrate together because World Cancer Day, the theme was again from prevention to palliation. And now I come to the last part of today's talk, which is the emotion, wherein we have to walk the tightrope. It is always a tightrope. So the various emotions that we feel, I think starting right ahead is empathy to your fellow colleagues, trust building, the art of gentle arts of uh, the, the gentle art of asking instead of telling, which we talk about, self-care, gratitude. All of these are very, very, very important pointers to, uh, to the emotion and to what we do in palliative care because as we are struggling with palliative care, they are also struggling with their patients. So team building and trust building is important only when we trust each other and when we self-reflect and we are grateful for what we are doing and we maintain that equipoise at all times, though it's really hard. So why do I say equanimity? Because here we are walking the tightrope. How? Because on one side is our colleague oncologist and on the other side, we are being a PhD advocate. Another thing we are trying to do is trying to bring a specialist service and holistic care together. So when we are doing this, we should not forget that the essence of palliative care is holistic care. So however specialized we get, we have to keep the, we have to integrate the community together and we have to keep the principles of palliative care alive in every patient whom we see. Then between networking and trying to do everything, it's hard to do everything. And so networking is important, but also delegating is very, very important. And we also need to know our professional boundaries and empathize with our colleagues. So when we say that your integration is my fragmentation, I think this is a law of integration which has been quoted and it is again a very, very important thing to remember that as we integrate, we have to build, we should not be fragmenting and we should also find congruence because we cannot try and integrate a square peg in a round hole. Team building, I always believe in team building. Because finally, it's the attitude that makes the difference and builds the team. So build on your strengths. To all the young MDs out here, your strengths are in your skills, in psychosocial distress, in communication, in spiritual distress. So use it to the maximum. The physical skills are always there. You have enough people for that. And you can contribute to that definitely. But use these skills and lead by example and create leaders. And, I mean, and the most important thing is generosity of spirit. Because just as we expect to be integrated into oncology, we need to integrate the allied services, which are physiotherapy, occupational therapy, psycho-oncology, all of this actively into our own discipline. And so I always believe that a dot can be a full stop, but it can also be a work of art. So let us try and team build. The way forward would be through collaborative research, through audits, nurse-led projects, there is, there is a world out there, and I think each one of us can do a lot more than what we are doing. So this is my last slide, and second last slide, and this is just a call out or a shout out to Gen Y, to all our young MDs out there. We have so much evidence. Can we build on it? Can we build a consensus document for India on integration of palliative care and oncology services? Could we have more clarity on hemato-oncology and palliative care interface? Could we build into pediatric palliative care? And for this, we need to have consensus with the oncology specialty. So in, if you can combine and do this together as young oncologists, I think that would be wonderful. So a big thank you to every one of my colleagues, my teachers in this presentation, to Homi Baba Cancer Hospital and both my directors, my founder director who set the path and my present director, Dr. Omesh Manchetti, who is who is with us through the way for palliative care. To TMC Mumbai, which is my parent institute. And a big thank you to Sneha Sandhya HK Foundation and Dr. Raju, without whom I don't think we could have built up any of this. To every one of my patients and caregivers and to the IPC Academy. And I'd like to close with happy Baisakhi, Yogadi, Guri Padva, Gishu, and a COVID-3 2021. Thank you so much. Thank you, Vidya. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Arun, go ahead with the question answer. Uh, Ma'am, there, there are no questions today. 
Oh, there are, there are no, no questions. Okay. So, if there are no questions, Vidya, I think it was an excellent presentation. In the way, uh, uh, I, why I tell excellent presentation? Because you have clearly mentioned that it is not that one model which is going to work. What are the various models which uh, we can use to integrate palliative care in continuum of patients and then you have shown your own model and your own model uh, means like extraordinary work we, you are doing we want to congratulate for the, you for, for this and uh, those who are trying to integrate palliative care in their own setup uh, I can tell you that it is not a journey of a day or a month or a year it is a continuous journey and uh, it's not going to be easy <clears throat> It is always difficult because since beginning, people have resistance that why they, we need this kind of services in our operations. But as you keep doing, as you keep proving yourself that integration of palliative care works well and it really improves quality of life of their patients, those who are looking after. And once they start finding the benefit in terms of patient care, as well as in their own workload, which which they 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 miss like it is impossible for an oncologist to explain the patient, prognosticate a patient. So when they they find it that it is useful, they start believing you, and you start gaining uh, recognition of your work. You start gaining popularity. As Vidya must have become very popular in his her in her hospital. So you start getting popularity, you start getting recognition. So it's not going to be a one month or one week job. And it is not that every model which you will pick up will suits in your hospital. Only thing you have to make a, your patient centered care. How can I provide a patient centered care patient on the priority? And how can I give a care to my patient with all oncologists, physiotherapists, dietitian, nutrition, uh, palliative care physician, occupational therapist together, how can we make the best, how can we give the best quality of life to the patient? That is what Dr. Brora has given an excellent model. Uh, many hospitals, I think they have given their own model integration of how they have integrated and nobody, I don't think that anybody should claim that this model is the best model, but at least they are providing their model and they are giving an example that this is possible. So I think uh, before we close, integration of palliative care in continuum of care is possible and we should try. It is only you who can make the difference. If you will work in a superficial level, it will not be possible. If you, if you will try to follow the other models, it will not be possible. You have to create a robust model for your patient, basic, keeping the basic principle in your mind then you will be able to integrate definitely one day. And uh, this is what I want to say. Thank you very much, Vidya. Anyone wants to give any comments? I think we, they are welcome. Anyone wants to give comments? Apologies for the sound. All the references are in the presentation. I will send it across. Thank you. Okay, then Vidya, thank you very much. Thank you, Arun. Thank you, Nisha. And now we have Archana with uh, Nisha. So thank you, Archana, who is helping Nisha all the time. And uh, thank you all the participants, those who have joined early morning at 6.30. Yes, I'm sorry, uh, madam. I have to say thank you to Nisha, Archana, and the entire team behind Anuja, Arun, uh, Seema, to whom I had made my presentation and said, just in case the technology fails me, be there for me. No, it was, so thank a, you it was, it was an excellent presentation. Only thing, there was a sound problem in the, in the, at the end. I don't know why there must be some. Uh, it. Uh, yeah, it was it. no, it's okay, no, it's okay. But it was an excellent presentation, no doubt about it, Vidya. So thank you very much, Vidya, and thank you everyone for joining early morning. Next week we will see you on next Monday, six thirty sharp. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you.